This is the first historical costume I ever made. Except I can't say that I made it because I never actually finished it. I probably got about 80% of the way there, then realized I had made a terrible error and stopped working on it. And since then, it has languished in my drawer of shame for eight years, between two houses and several more successful costumes later. What was my error? Well, that ties into the title of this video of what I'd wish I'd known before starting my historical costuming journey. And while I tell you my story, I'm hoping I'll be able to, at last, finish this costume. And while I'm unpacking it, maybe you can guess what it is. But first, some backstory. Unlike many historical costumers, I didn't come into costuming because my family was involved in reenactment. I didn't slide over from the world of cosplay. I was never really into vintage fashion or period piece films. I sew clothes. Regular, non-costume, muggle clothes. And I've been doing that for over half my life. I've made most of my wardrobe. Pretty much everything you see me wear in these videos that isn't a ratty old t-shirt, I made that. But one day, several years ago, I had an epiphany. I was packing my suitcase for a week-long vacation, and normally I'd be scrambling to find enough pieces that would work together for where I was going, and I'd inevitably have empty spots in my travel wardrobe that needed to be filled. But this time, packing was easy. And unlike any other time before, I had to take stuff out of the bag. And it dawned on me. I have enough clothes. And my immediate next thought was, what else can I sew? So after I got back from my trip, I was scouring Pinterest and fell into an epic rabbit hole of extant historic gowns. I began researching and thinking, okay, what would be a good starting point for sewing historical clothing? And that brings me to the first thing I wish I had known when I started. Historical sewing takes a long, long time. Now, I knew this going in, but knowing something ahead of time is often way different than knowing it while you're in the middle of it. Think about it. If you want to make a dress for your modern wardrobe, you likely already own a bra and underwear and shoes and jewelry and socks or tights. But if you want to make a mid-Victorian outfit, you gotta have the chemise and the stockings and the corset and the corded petticoat and maybe a bustle and another petticoat and more petticoats on top of that because why the hell not? And that's all before you can even put on the actual dress you wanted to make in the first place. But of course, I didn't want to spend my time doing all of that nonsense. I just wanted to make a dress. Like, any dress. So then, while at the big box fabric store, I came across this pattern. This is an 1860s design. Civil War was a popular era several years ago, so the big four companies published a lot of patterns from that time period. I saw this and thought, the skirt is just a gathered rectangle, that's easy, and the bodice is only fitted at the shoulders and the waist, which meant very little fitting. I thought I could get away with making this dress concurrently while I also made all the undergarments. That way, I wouldn't get burned out sewing the petticoats before I got to the actual dress. From all my research, I at least knew to curb my ambition for a first project. I knew making a hoop skirt would be too much for me as a beginner, so I decided to make a work dress. Something unfussy, plain, no hoops required. So I bought some of this cotton check fabric that looked vaguely old-timey and went to work. And this brings me to the second thing I wish I had known when I started. Historical sewing and modern sewing are not the same. I already knew how to sew, I knew how patterns worked, I'd even drafted some of my own patterns. I could hand sew decently, but I quickly learned that there are a lot of sewing techniques that have been lost to time with the advent of sewing machines. Like cartridge pleating, the mantua maker seam, the prick stitch. Setting in a sleeve in the 18th century is a way different process than how we set in sleeves today. Leveling the hem of a skirt was different then. And there were so many things about hand sewing in the past that I just did not know. Unfortunately, this Butterick pattern did 
absolutely nothing to fill in those huge gaps in my historical sewing knowledge. For example, several seam lines were to be piped on this dress, and while it did call for 1 8 inch wide piping, I couldn't find that at the store, so I got this thick piping from the drapery section. But if the pattern had told me the reasoning why seams were piped, or how historically piping would have been far more petite than it is today, I may have tried harder to find that smaller cording, like the size I'm going to replace this with. The pattern also completely lacked any kind of comprehensible instructions on cartridge pleating the skirt. I had to look up an online tutorial on how to do it. But I didn't recognize the biggest problem with this pattern until I was probably 75% into it. I had started working on the lining. I cut pieces out of muslin and thought, this is odd, why doesn't the lining match the outer bodice? Why is it cut so low in the neckline? Why do they want me to put lace on a neckline like it's a chemise when you won't ever see it? Is this how 1860s bodices would have been done? But I trusted the directions and did it anyway. Until I realized... This is a sheer dress. If you don't know what an 1860s sheer dress is, they looked like this. The idea is you have an outer layer of sheer fabric, like cotton organdy, sometimes embroidered or trimmed, layered over an opaque underdress. The underdress often had a low neckline and short sleeves like an evening gown, except this was fancy summer day wear. And that was like the exact opposite look from what I was going for. But looking at this envelope, I totally wouldn't have guessed that. I saw a plain brown dress. I didn't even notice the faint line of the lining until I knew to look for it. The line drawing doesn't give any indication that it's supposed to be sheer, and the fabric recommendations are voile, lawn, lightweight cotton. Now, I've sewn with voile and lawn many times, and while they can sometimes be semi-sheer, I certainly don't think of them as sheer fabrics. Organza is sheer. Chiffon is sheer. All that brings me to my next lesson. Use indie patterns. Big four pattern instructions are notoriously poor, as is their sizing. I knew this well enough from my own modern sewing experience, but this issue is only exacerbated when it comes to any kind of historical design. Sometimes these patterns are designed by professional historical dressmakers. They're doing their research. They're often copying real extant dresses. They're using accurate fabrics. But none of that gets translated into the pattern descriptions or instructions. Sometimes the photos and line drawings don't even do the garment justice. So you get pictures of dresses that look like this sad, sad gown. I know I've seen several people make beautiful costumes from this pattern, but you would never guess that by looking at this photo. While the quality and variety of historical indie patterns varies, most of them at least include context, references, and detailed instructions for specific techniques. I probably could have avoided a bunch of my mistakes had I just went with an indie pattern first and foremost. At this point, I was so frustrated with the dress that I wanted to quit, but I figured maybe I could still salvage it. I took apart the bodice, ditched the lining entirely, and re-sewed the front with darts instead of gathers but I still faced the problem of what to do with the sleeves. And that's when I gave up. Partially due to my frustration, but partially because I was plagued by feelings of inadequacy. See, back then I was experiencing the unfortunate combination of wanting to be extremely historically accurate, while at the same time having no clue what I was doing. I was so preoccupied with this obsession with accuracy, I was constantly second-guessing myself. I even made a little visual, a personification of that nagging voice in my head always telling me I'm doing it wrong. A figure cut out of a fashion plate and dubbed Dixie Victorian. So like, Dixie DIY, Dixie Victorian, also Victoria is my middle name. She would appear periodically on my blog, questioning my accuracy while I questioned my sanity. If I could have been so wrong about judging the type of dress seen on a pattern cover, what else was I getting wrong about historical fashion? Well, in the eight plus years of historical sewing since then, I've learned a lot. I know that mid-century work dresses commonly had gathered sleeves, but they weren't nearly as big as the sleeves in this pattern. 
They also frequently had waistbands, which it seems dressier dresses from this time period usually did not. The skirt in my Butterick pattern is a whopping 160 inches around, while a typical work dress skirt would have been closer to 100 to 130 inches. But more than that, I've learned to let go of some of the perfectionism and embrace historical adequacy. Like, I love a good hand-sewn seam as much as anyone, but I am not here to perfect an ancient technique. I am here to finish dresses so that I can wear them. Eventually. But you can't let that lingering thought of, what if I get it wrong, stop you from finishing the dress. Or using the trim. Or the lace. Or that color. Or whatever it is. You can always make another better, more accurate dress after you finish the first one. This dress turned out far better than I expected considering what I started with. It's a pretty convincing recreation, if I do say so myself. Even though it took me eight years to complete, I am proud of myself for actually going back and doing the work to be able to finish and now wear the dress. So let me give you a quick rundown of all the things I did to get my dress to this point. I shortened and slimmed the sleeves to make them less gigantic. I added vintage china buttons and hand-sewn buttonholes. I replaced the piping with smaller cord. I reverted the front waist darts back to gathers, shortened the bodice, and added a waistband. I took a full panel out of the skirt, re-cartridge pleated the waist, sewed it to the new piped waistband, and hemmed the dress about eight inches shorter than it was originally. And now, I can finally be done with it. Except, we still have one more lesson to learn. The dress alone is never enough. The accessories are what really make the outfit. Now I'm thinking I need a corded sunbonnet and an apron, definitely an apron, with pockets because this dress does not have pockets. Would one have worn collars and cuffs with a work dress, or is that only for fancier dresses? And I desperately need some period appropriate shoes. And still, after all this time, I have never made a proper set of drawers. <laughs>